I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today we continue with section 913 of The Incarnation of Ahriman by Rudolf Seiner. We're picking up at the end of Lecture 5, Burn, 1919. The people who often profess humility in these matters, and they are insistent about it, are actually the most arrogant of all. More and more generally, it is being said that people should steer themselves in the mere simplicity of the gospel and not attempt to understand the mystery of Golgotha by entering into the complexities of spiritual science. Those whose feign unpretentiousness in the study of the gospels are the most arrogant of all, for they despise the honest search for knowledge demanded in spiritual science. So arrogant are they that they believe the highest revelation of the spiritual world can be garnered without effort, simply through a naive approach to the Gospels. What claims to be humble or simple today is often supreme arrogance, particularly as found in sects and religious confessions. It must be remembered that the Gospels came into existence at a time when Luciferic wisdom still survived. In the first centuries of Christendom, people's understanding of the Gospels was quite different from what it came to be in later times. Today's people who cannot gain deeper understanding through spiritual science, science merely pretend to understand the Gospels. In reality, they have no idea even of the original meaning of the words, for the translations that have been made into different languages are not faithful reproductions of the Gospels. Often they are scarcely even a shadow of the original meaning of the words in which the Gospels were composed. Real understanding of the intervention of the Christ being an earthly evolution is possible today only through the spiritual science. Those who want to study or actually to study the Gospels through a simple and naive approach cannot come to any inner realization of the Christ being as he truly is, but only to an illusory being, or at very most a vision or hallucination of the Christ being. No real connection with the Christ impulse can be achieved today merely through reading of the Gospels but only a hallucinatory picture of the Christ. Hence the prevalence of the theological view that the Christ was not present in the man Jesus of Nazareth, who was simply a historical figure like Socrates or Plato or others. Although possibly more exalted, the simple man of Nazareth is an ideal even to theologians, and very few of them indeed can make anything of an event like Paul's vision at the gate of Damascus. Because without the deepened knowledge yielded by spiritual science, the, the Gospels can give rise only to a hallucination of the Christ, not to a vision of the real Christ. And so Paul's vision at Damascus is also regarded as a hallucination. Deeper understanding of the Gospels in the light of spiritual science is essential today. Ariman will make up most use of the apathy that takes hold of people who are content to live merely within the safe confines of creeds and denominations in order to achieve his goal. His intention is for his incarnation to catch people unawares. And those who believe that they are being most truly Christian by rejecting any development of the conception of the Christ mystery are, in their arrogance, the ones who do most to promote Ariman's aims. The denominations and sects are positively spheres of encouragement, breeding grounds for Ariman. It's futile to gloss these things over with allusions. This is the materialistic attitude rejecting the spiritual altogether and contending that the human being is a product of what people eat and drink furthers Ariman's aims. So are these aims furthered by the stubborn rejection of everything spiritual and adherence to a literal, simple conception of the Gospels. You see, to prevent individual Gospels from unduly circumscribing the human mind, the event of Golgotha is described in the Gospels from four seemingly contradictory sides. Only a little reflection will show that this is a protection to safeguard against too literal a conception. In sects, however, where one gospel only is taken at the basis of doctrine, and such sects are quite numerous, pitfalls, stupefaction, and hallucination are generated. In their day, the gospels were given as a necessary counterweight to, to Luciferic gnosis. But if no attempt is made to develop understanding of their content, the aims of Ariman are furthered, not the progress of humankind, in the absolute sense, neither is good in itself, but is always good or bad, according to the use to which it's put. The best can be the worst if wrongly used. Sublime though they are, the Gospels can also have the opposite effect that people are too lazy to search for a deeper understanding based on spiritual science. Hence, 
There's a great deal in the spiritual and unspiritual currents of the present time of which people should be acutely aware and determine their attitude of soul accordingly. People's ability and willingness to penetrate to the roots of such matters will determine the effect of Ariman's incarnation upon human beings, whether this incarnation will lead them to prevent the earth from reaching its goal or bring home to them the very limited significance and scope of unspiritual intellectual life. If people adopt the right stance to tendencies leading toward Ariman, then simply through his incarnation in earthly life, they will recognize the Ariamonic influence on the one hand, and on the other its polar opposite, the Luciferic influence. And then the very contrast between the Ariamonic and Luciferic will enable them to perceive the third reality. Human beings must consciously wrestle through to an understanding of this trinity of the Christian impulse, the Ariamonic and Luciferic influences. For without this awareness, they will not be able to go forward into the future with the prospect of achieving the goal of earth existence. An attitude of deep, of deep earnestness towards spiritual science must be cultivated, for only so can it be rightly understood. It is not the outcome of any sectarian whim, but something that has proceeded from the fundamental needs of human evolution. Those who recognize these needs cannot choose between whether they will or will not endeavor to engage with spiritual science. On the contrary, they will say in themselves, the whole physical and spiritual life of human beings must be illuminated and pervaded by the conceptions of spiritual science. Just as once in the East there was a Luciferic incarnation, and then at the midpoint, as it were, of world evolution, the incarnation of Christ, so in the West there will be an incarnation of Ariman. The Ariamonic incarnation cannot be averted. It's inevitable, for humanity must encounter Ariman face to face. He is the individuality, who will demonstrate what indescribable cleverness can be developed through invoking all that the earthly forces can do to enhance cleverness and ingenuity. In the catastrophes that will befall humanity in the near future, people will become extremely inventive. Many things discovered in the forces and substances of the universe will be used to provide human nourishment. But these very discoveries will at the same time make it apparent that matter is connected with the organs of intellect, not with the organs of the spirit, but of the intellect. People will learn what to eat and drink in order to become really clever. Eating and drinking cannot make them spiritual, but clever and astute, yes. Humanity has no knowledge of these things as yet, but they will be the inevitable outcome of catastrophes looming in the near future. And some certain secret societies, where preparations are already in progress, will apply these things in such a way that the necessary conditions can be established for an actual incarnation of Ariaman on the earth. This incarnation cannot be averted, for it is an essential part of earthly evolution that people realize just how much can proceed from purely material processes. But at the same time, we must learn to bring under our control those spiritual or unspiritual currents which are leading to Ariman. Once it is realized that conflicting party programs can be proved equally correct, our attitude of soul will change from setting out to prove things to experiencing them. For to experience a thing is a very different matter from attempting to prove it intellectually. Equally, we shall be convinced that deeper and deeper penetration of the Gospels is necessary by drawing on spiritual science. The literal word-for-word -word acceptance of the Gospels that is still so prevalent today promotes Arimonic culture. Even on external grounds, it is obvious that a strictly literal acceptance of the Gospels is unjustified. For as you know, what is good and right for one time is not right for every other time. What is right for one epoch becomes Luciferic or Arimonic when practiced in a later one. The mere reading of the gospel text has had its day. What is essential now is to acquire a spiritual understanding of the mystery of Golgotha in light of the truths enshrined in the gospels. Many people, of course, find these things disquieting. But those whose interest is kindled by anthroposophy must learn to realize that the levels of culture gradually superimposed upon each other have created chaos, and that light must penetrate again into this chaos. It is interesting nowadays to learn to s listen to someone whose views have become very extreme or to read about some burning question of the day and then to listen to sermons on the same subject given by a priest or some denomination who is still seeped in the form of thought current in bygone times there you face two worlds which you cannot possibly confuse unless you avoid all attempts to get at the root of these things listen to a modern socialist speaking about social questions, and then, immediately afterwards, to a Catholic preacher speaking about the same questions. It's very interesting to find two levels of culture existing side by side, but using the words in an entirely different sense. The same word has quite a different meaning in each case. These things should be seen in the light that will dawn if they are taken in the earnest spirit we have been trying to convey. 
People belonging to religious groups also come in the end to long in their way for spiritual deepening. It is by no means without significance that a man in as eminently spiritual as Cardinal Newman, ardent Catholic though he was, should say as his investiture in Rome that he could see no salvation for Christianity other than a new revelation. However, he did not have the courage to take the new spiritual revelation seriously, and so it is with many others. You can read countless treatises today about what is needed in society. Another book has recently appeared, Socialism by Robert Wilbrandt, the study, the son of a poet. In it, the social questions discussed based on accurate and detailed knowledge. And finally, the author states that without the spirit, nothing is achieved, that actual events show how necessary is the spirit. Yes, but what does such a man really achieve? He gets as far as uttering the word spirit, the abstract word spirit, but he refuses to accept, and indeed he rejects, anything that endeavors to make the spirit really take effect. It is essential to realize that indulging in abstractions, however loud the cry for the spirit, is not yet spiritual, not yet spirit. Vague, abstract, chattering of the spirit must never be confused with an active search for the content of the spiritual world pursued in anthroposophical science. Nowadays, there is much talk about the spirit, but you who acknowledge spiritual science should not be deluded by such chattering. You should perceive the difference between it and descriptions of the spiritual world attempted in anthroposophy, where the spiritual world is described as objectively as the physical world. You should probe into these differences, reminding yourselves repeatedly that abstract talk of the spirit is a distraction from sincere striving for, for the spirit, and that by their very talk, people are actually distancing themselves from the spirit. Purely intellectual allusion to the spirit leads nowhere. What then is intelligence? What is the content of our human intelligence? I can best explain this in the following way. Imagine, and this will be better understood by the many ladies present, imagine yourself standing in front of the mirror and looking into it. The picture presented to you by the mirror is you, but it is no reality at all. It is nothing but a reflection. All the intelligence within your soul, all the intellectual content is only a mirror image. It has no reality. And just as your reflected image is called into existence through the mirror, so what mirrors itself as intelligence is called into existence through the physical apparatus of your body, through the brain. You are intelligent only because your body is there. And as little as you can touch yourself by stretching your hand toward your reflected image, as little as you can lay hold of the spirit if you turn only to the intellectual, for the spirit is not there, what is grasped through the intellect, ingenious as it may be, never contains the spirit itself, but only a picture of the spirit. You cannot truly experience the spirit if you get no further than mere intelligence. The reason why intelligence is so seductive is that it yields a picture, a reflected picture of the spirit, but not the spirit itself. It seems unnecessary to go to the inconvenience of penetrating to the spirit, because it is there, or so at least one imagines. In reality... It is only a reflected picture, but for all that, it is not difficult to talk about the spirit. To distinguish the mere picture from the reality, that is the task of the approach, which does not merely theorize about spiritual science, but is actual perception of the spirit. That is why I wanted to say to you today that in order to intensify the earnestness which should pervade our whole attitude to the spiritual life as conceived by Anthroposophy, for the evolution of humanity in the future will depend upon how truly this attitude is adopted by people of the present day. If what I have characterized in this lecture continues to be received or rather rejected in the same way as it is today by the vast majority of people on the earth, then Ariman will be an evil guest when he comes. But if people are able to rouse themselves to absorb the significance of what we have been studying, if they are able to master these things so that humanity can develop the right, autonomous stance towards the Arimanic influence, then... When Aryan appears, human beings will acquire, precisely through him, the power to realize that although the earth must inevitably decline, humankind will be raised above the earthly existence through this very fact. When human beings have reached a certain age in physical life, the body begins to decline. But if they are wise, they make no complaint, knowing that together with the soul they are embarking on a life that does not run parallel with this physical decline. There lives in humankind something that is not bound up with the incipient decline of the physical earth, but becomes more and more spiritual as a direct consequence of the physical decline. Let us learn to say frankly, yes, the earth is in decline, and human life too, as far as its physical manifestation is concerned. But just because it is so, let us muster the strength to 
who draw into our civilization that element which, springing from humankind itself, will live on when the earth declines as the immortal fruit of earth evolution. Thus concludes section 913 of the Incarnation of Ahriman. Next time we will continue with section 914, starting a new lecture, number 6, Stuttgart. I'll see you then. Alam.